Good afternoon and welcome to this Experian Marketing Services webinar. My name is James Murray, I'm the Digital Insight Manager at Experian Marketing Services and I'm joined um, with the uh, technical wizard Matt Potter who is our um, Director of Products and Propositions um, here at Experian. Um, we're here today to talk about um, social media and um, principally what we're going to be talking about is um, some of the trends that we're sort of seeing emerging um, in uh, social by using some of our um, Hitwise data and then also sort of how you can start to uh, use social in slightly different ways um, and so what we think um, is going to be the, sort of the future of what's going to be happening in the social circles. Um, so just a quick reminder this is um, uh, the third of, of three webinars which we've been um, running over May. Um, we ran our first one on the 10th of May around search um, and we ran our second one uh, last week on um, email and this one is the sort of the, the final part of the trio um, all around social. If you want to um, look at some of the previous ones which we did, um, the recordings uh, should be up on the website in the next sort of week or so and um, so we thoroughly uh, encourage you to go and have a look at some of that content. But on with today and um, so it's always a good idea to sort of start off with um, Experian for those of you who are, who are not familiar. Um, Experian is probably best known as a, a financial services um, a provider of data um, but you know the reality is it's not just sort of credit checks which is perhaps what we're sort of best known for. Experian is really just a, a big data company um, and the first thing to, to understand is that you know we have a lot of data. And when we talk about having a lot of data um, we know 500 things about 49 million people in the UK across 24 million households. And that's quite an extraordinary um, amount of, of data and an amount of things to know. Um, I always say if you think about you know, some of your close relationships, some of uh, your sort of friends or work colleagues, um, you might know a, quite a sort of bit about them, about um, you know, what their preferences are, what they, um, music they like listening to, where they live, um, but you know, to know uh, 500 things, I think even some of your sort of closest friends, um, getting to sort of list 500 things that you know about them is actually a, quite a difficult challenge to do. And yet we've got um, all of this data, um, about 49 million people in the country. And what that does is it um, gives us a huge amount of insight into um, the way that people behave, both online and offline, um, and we're going to share some of those sort of insights with you today. So the first thing that we um, wanted to do and to sort of share with you is uh, the way that people sort of spend their time online. Um, essentially what we've got here is um, we've said if we took all of the time which people spend um, online and condensed that into a single hour, what would that hour look like? And it's perhaps not that surprising to see that the thing that people do the most online is go on social networks. So roughly what this um, chart shows is that about a quarter of all time spent online is on a social media website. Um, so 14 minutes of that, of that hour um, are spent on social sites. And then you've got some of the other things that people do online. Um, so they go to uh, entertainment sites when they want to look at um, sort of movies and music and gossip. About five minutes of that hour um, would be spent shopping online. Um, and then you've got sort of news and business and, and some of the other industries that people are doing. But the key thing here is that social is what people um, spend most of their time doing online. Um, and so there's an awful a lot of uh, sort of eyeballs on social um, websites and therefore capturing um, people and, and understanding what they're doing on those sites is a really important thing to do. On the sort of the flip side of that, when we're talking about um, social as an actual sort of driver of traffic, um, it's not um, sort of nearly as sort of powerful as, as some of the other um, sort of industry drivers out there. So what I've done here is have a look at the sort of the year-on-year -year changes of how um, what proportion of traffic going to retail websites is coming um, from different uh, sort of uh, online um, channels. So search engines is um, very much the predominant driver, and in fact. Um, search is increasing online, um, but if we look at social media, it uh, now accounts for about 8% of all traffic um, driving uh, visits to, to websites. Um, and that's actually decreased year on year um, from, uh, from what we had a look when we were having a look at March last year. And there's a couple of things to sort of caveat about this and a couple of things to mention. Um, the first is that you know, we think 
part of the reason um, why the sort of the decrease is, is obviously because of the growth of search. So as people rely more on search engines, they're getting um, less proportionate from other um, uh, channels online, in particular um, in social. Um, so that's not to say that there are actually less visits coming. It's just as a as a total proportion of the traffic, um, social is um, is accounting for less of the whole pie. But if that pie is getting bigger, then social is still very important. Um, but one of the other things to sort of say is that um, as we've seen with uh, things like Bing and some of the other search engines, as um, social is starting to influence the results of um, what you um, see when you type in search engines. Um, so, if, for example, if your friends like on Facebook a, a certain um, website, if you type something which is relevant to that website, it's likely to appear much higher in the, um, in the search rankings. Um, the effect which social is having, um, this chart doesn't really tell the full picture. So it's giving you a uh, insight into the direct correlation between where traffic is coming from, but it's not giving you the whole thing about this sort of influence that social is having on the way that people are, are sort of arriving at different websites. And sort of one of the, the sort of the other things to point out is um, the sort of the various the differences between what social and what search and, and, and email to a certain extent cater to. So um, we know that social is all about sort of content really, and um, by looking at the downstream traffic, i.e., so where do um, where do these sort of top sites send traffic to? Um, we can see some sort of key trends emerging here. So what I've done is have a look at uh, sort of four of the, uh, the big players um, with in, who are sort of like the flagship leaders for microblogging with Twitter, um, social with Facebook, search with Google, and um, email uh, with Hotmail. And if we look at the um, where traffic goes after leaving um, those websites, for the social ones, so for Twitter and Facebook, a very high proportion of that traffic is going to uh, content-based websites. So for Twitter, 66% of all visits leaving Twitter are going to content-based websites, so the likes of other social networks, entertainment sites, and news and media sites. Whereas a smaller proportion is coming, um, so Google and Hotmail, 39% um, and 37% of those are going to the content-based websites. Whereas if we look at the traffic which has been delivered to transactional sites, it's um, Google and Hotmail have a much higher proportion than the social sites which are delivering traffic to online retailers, to um, business and finance sites, and to travel sites. So we know um, intuitively, and we know also by looking at the data, that social really caters for the content-based websites, but is not really having the same kind of impact in transactional-based websites. And we're going to be talking a little bit later about um, why that's not necessarily a problem, and how you can start to use content to sort of um, bring together all of the various um, parts of your multi-channel marketing to make sure that you're getting the most out of social. It doesn't necessarily have to be the key driver to bring traffic to your website. So you might be uh, having a look at those last two slides asking the question, okay, well, why is it that I need to bother about social media? Why, why, um, why do I need to invest in it? And the key reason um, here is uh, it's about volume. You know, two uh, we see in our data that every month there are 2.5 billion visits going to social networking um, websites. And every month, 730 million hours are spent um, looking at social media sites. So there's a huge amount of uh, volume going to these websites and an, uh, a massive amount of time spent on these websites. If you can just get in there and, and under, like trying to sort of touch customers at, at these points when they're on the social sites, um, you can learn an awful lot about them, uh, but also you can start to um, engage with them and get them to start coming to your own brand website. And when we're talking about social, it's difficult uh, to avoid the, the topic of Facebook. Um, for you know, Facebook is an absolutely monstrous website, um, and I just wanted to sort of highlight some of the key sort of stats around Facebook to show you. We all know that it's big and that it's it's very prominent in social um, media, but Sometimes uh, some of these stats, you know, are actually um, really sort of brings to the fore just how important Facebook is as a, as a player in this industry. So first up, Facebook is the second biggest website in the UK um, after Google. Um, Google obviously is um, the sort of the means by which um, people go um, about the web, but um, Facebook is um, the second biggest website um, overall. And uh, one in every seven page views in the UK 
um, is on a Facebook page. Um, the website receives over a billion UK internet visits every single month um, and 20 million hours are spent on Facebook in the UK alone every single day. Um, and so in terms of, again, that sort of engagement and the sort of the sheer volume, if you're not working um, on Facebook and if your brand isn't engaged on Facebook, you're missing out a huge um, sort of potential opportunity there. But I think the key stat, and, and remember we talked to, that um, actually in terms of driving traffic, social media is, is declining overall. Um, the thing to really sort of uh, to remember is that one in every 10 visits um, online going to a website comes from Facebook in the UK. So even though social media overall is um, you know, perhaps declining and is not as powerful as it was last year, um, the fact that one in every 10 visits online is coming from Facebook shows you just how powerful this is as a driver of traffic, um, but also as a way to understand uh, sort of who your customers are. And you know, we get a lot of stuff um, comparing, you know, is how's online advertising working against um, some of the sort of broad um, channels like sort of um, TV and other advertising platforms. Um, it's quite interesting to see sort of how people spend uh, time online, and this is something that we took uh, from a, a couple of years ago. We had a look at the um, Barb statistics for the number of people, uh, the number of hours rather, that were spent in the UK watching um, the EastEnders Christmas special on Christmas Day, um, and we found that there were six million hours in total um, watching um, the EastEnders um, special across the country. And compare that to the number of hours that were spent on Facebook, there were 24 million hours in total. So essentially what we're saying there, four times as much time um, was spent on Facebook uh, on Christmas Day than there was watching EastEnders. And if you think about how um, powerful EastEnders is in, um, for, um, for the BBC and, and sort of how much um, time and effort is, is spent sort of promoting that, um, that really goes to show you just, just how sort of big Facebook is um, and um, how people are engaging with it. Um, and the other thing to sort of concentrate on is uh, just sort of how Facebook compares to some of the other sort of social networks out there. Um, so the likes of LinkedIn, another sort of very prominent network online, um, but if we were uh, to take all of the visits in a month um, going to Facebook and represent that as this blue sort of circle here, then this tiny red circle would represent the number of visits that go to LinkedIn. And in fact, um, when we look at it, um, Facebook receives twice as many visits in a single day as LinkedIn receives in a month. Um, and that's why there's sort of so much focus around Facebook is because of the sheer sort of size, volume, magnitude of the, of the people that you can reach um, through that. Um, but just to sort of uh, take a step back, Facebook obviously is, is key and is, is hugely dominant within social media, um, but that's not to say um, that it's the only thing that you should be investing in in social. Um, so increasingly we're finding that um, marketing is becoming a sort of a game of, of being able to sort of tap into these um, very sort of niche products or, or, or niche audiences. And um, social really allows you to be able to do that. Um, Hitwise in particular monitors over 9,000 different social networks every single day in the UK. Um, and so finding the right audience um, and the right social network for your brand can actually be much more effective than um, just going for the sort of the mass power and the mass volume of Facebook. And one of the um, examples that I want to use to sort of highlight that is a company called Etsy. Um, Etsy really understands social media. And if you've never sort of been to their website, they're kind of like a, an eBay um, for the sort of arts and crafts uh, sort of retailers and, and people who want to sort of sell things which they, which they make. Um, but the sort of the cool thing about Etsy is they really sort of they, they want to be able to differentiate themselves from the crowd and they've really sort of taken social media to heart uh, and they started to get an awful lot of traffic from social by being sort of just very clever about the way that they approach it. So this is their um, a screenshot which I took from their um, Twitter page um, and you can see that they've uh, they've done an extraordinary number of sort of tweets and um, but the really big thing there is they've got over 1.6 million followers on their um, Twitter feed. Now I've been following Etsy for quite a long time. Back in August, uh, they had just 345,000 followers, which is still pretty significant. But um, when you consider sort of the size of the company 
and um, also you know this this is not a major brand in this in the same way um, that some of the likes of, uh, sort of Argos or Topshop and yet the fact that they've got so many followers means they must be doing something right and the thing that they are doing is really sort of engaging with the people who they know are their sort of core customers and giving them stuff which they want to see and this sort of um, highlights basically what the um, the results of that um, hard work are, are sort of the, the dividends which they're seeing from that. So when you look at the downstream um, websites who are receiving traffic from Twitter um, back in August 2010, you can see that Etsy was the seventh biggest retailer overall who were getting traffic from Twitter. Um, so they're getting more traffic than the likes of Argos, River Island, New Look, all really, really big brands. Um, and they were doing that because they were more engaged um, than, than the competition. Now, um, this was uh, April, so last month, uh, Etsy is still the 15th biggest um, recipient of traffic um, overall in the sort of retail sector from Twitter. Uh, so it's not doing um, as well as it was, but obviously um, more brands have cottoned on to the fact that Twitter is um, a, a sort of a very prominent place where people go a lot and where they can attract customers, um, but it's still doing very well. And in fact, it's still sort of punching above its weight um, against some of the like really big brands, the likes of Argos, Next, and Tesco. Um, but the, the, you know what's interesting is that they um, refuse to sort of stand still. They're not just relying on one channel, and so it's perhaps um, not surprising to see that um, sort of flavor of the month. Pinterest. There's a lot of people who are talking about Pinterest. Um, Etsy is the number one recipient um, in the retail space for traffic from Pinterest. Um, and so they've seen this as an emerging trend that a lot of people are interested in um, in sharing sort of pinboarding stuff and photos. Um, and this is a great avenue for Etsy to really sort of showcase some of the things um, that its uh, members are sort of making. Um, and so by understanding who your customers are and being able to sort of jump in and, and um, uh, use the trends of uh, what are the fast moving social networks, you, you can, even as a relatively small brand like Etsy, really dominate that space and in fact they're doing much much better um, than some of the the massive brands out there the likes of um, the Amazons, um, Ebays and um, and top shops of the world. To take a slightly different example but nevertheless um, you know a, a very important example we know that social media is um, very cool and um, but a lot of brands complain that you know how can I get involved in social media um, if I'm in the sort of a slightly less sexy organization um, like Lloyd's TSB. So finance um, is not the easiest thing to be sort of uh, get social around um, with when you sort of compare it to something like uh, the sort of the fashion industry. However, um, you know, this example really does highlight that actually even for someone like Lloyd's, um, you can, if you're um, smart and innovative, you can um, really start to see the benefits from social. Um, so what this uh, chart shows is that Lloyd's um, obviously is one of the Olympic sponsors. They ran a microsite around London 2012, and um, during August, uh, at one point they were getting over 35% of all of their visits coming to this microsite were coming from social networks. And when we dug a little bit deeper into why that was happening, um, it was all around the sort of Facebook activity which Lloyd's was um, building up around the Olympics. So they were quite clever in the sense that they um, they wanted to uh, get people who were torchbearers to start taking photos of themselves, and if they were Lloyd's customers, getting them to upload uh, that to the um, Lloyd's Facebook page. They got celebrities involved, so they got the likes of One Directions who also sort of joined in with this. Um, but then they also started doing um, cool stuff like releasing um, unique YouTube content through Facebook first and getting people to sort of look at that and share that. Now, the overall sort of effect of this, you know, what's the benefit for Lloyd's, is that 8% of all people who were leaving this microsite um, during August clicked through to another part of the Lloyd's CSB website. So these were new customers who were coming because they were interested in the Olympics, but then they were coming through and um, maybe looking for a new credit card or a mortgage or a loan. Um, and what's you know, particularly good for Lloyd's is that half of those people had never visited the Lloyd's TSP website before. So this is a great sort of uh, advocate for why social media is important. It allows you to um, touch audiences who, who um, perhaps wouldn't visit your website normally, um, bringing new customers on board, um, and it's a great way to sort of interact and engage with people. 
So I'm now going to pass over uh, to Matt, who's going to um, talk a little bit more about the sort of the wider context of social media. Um, and uh, well, no no need for me to go on anymore. Over to you, Matt. Thank you. So what's become um, what's become apparent to me is um, whilst we do get traffic directly from social media, um, it's also interesting to look at how social media affects everything else that we that we do throughout marketing. So um, within within digital here, we started to look at um, how we can kind of categorize what we do, and we we, we put it into to three simple areas, um, which is yeah we know more about we know about um, our market, we know more about uh, the audience that's available, and we know the kind of angle to to approach um, to approach customers. Um, we're good at looking at um, how you get more traffic, how you get more customers, how you get better results and how you can keep those people longer, how you can engage with them, how you can keep them sharing, keep them spending. And if we kind of if we kind of focus on um, on these three categories, and then I'll I'll have a look at how um, how social media kind of impacts um, each of those. So if I'm going to look at um, at social and looking at how um, it helps me know my kind of my angle of attack, what to talk to prospects about, what to talk to customers about. Um, for me, it starts first with the real estate, and by the real estate, I mean what is the the kind of the the creative landscape that you have in order to to talk with your customers and prospects. And traditionally, that's that's your um, that's your website, and predominantly um, there's you know there's the, the kind of the the outbound broadcast mechanism of email, which if you think of email as as the ability to broadcast a page of your website out to to customers, it kind of makes um, it makes a little more sense. But now we have um, we have a social media venue, we have Facebook pages, we have Twitter pages. We actually have different real estate that we can use to get across a variety of messages. So that's, that's the, first, uh, the first point of consideration. We also know now a lot more about people. Um, we used to just know really customers and prospects. Um, customers kind of transcend. They, um, they could be, uh, you know, we could know all sorts of information about them because they've registered, they've bought, they've... You know, they've, they've shopped, they've browsed, they've done all of those things. Um, they could be subscribing to existing marketing campaigns, so we know their their behaviour or lack of behaviour. Um, and now we have this extra this extra group who who are fans. Um, so they've they've given um, either the the ability for us as a as a brand to push messages to them as fans, or they've connected um, through um, through things like Facebook and through the the um, the kind of connections that you can do there and access to their social graph. So you now know more about individuals than you did before. So we have real estate and we have information about people. And what that gives us is, um, is uh, that combination, if you like, is people can go to a piece of real estate, they can identify who they are, and then they can show us things. The, the beauty of social media is that it is, it is social, it is about you and your likes and your personal interests. Uh, there are very few people who've, um, you know, who've benefited from using something like Facebook by putting in um, falsified information, because your friends know who you are and they know whether you're telling the truth. And the whole basis behind um, social media is that you're you're having a social experience with your friends, not trying to be pretending something that you are. So, the the beauty of that is that um, we get information on likes. We get we get what people's feelings are rather than purely um, you know, things that they've, they've done, places they've been, uh, and things that they respond to. We get to know that, that they're interested in certain topics. Um, if, we, you know, if we scrape content from things like Twitter, we get to know what they're talking about. There's a whole, there's a whole, um, there's a whole mass of information that we just never had access to for, so, before. So it's not, it's not about driving traffic from a site. It's about what can we get, what information can we get, what can we learn, Based on how people interact with that site. Um, so, how do we? Um, how does it help us in the get phase? How does it help us get more of anything? Well, actually, it helps us get more of most things. So, if it's um, if it's about traffic or um, or influence, historically, you'd be looking at maybe um, you know uh, display advertising across the web, broadcast via email, uh, banners within your own site, redirecting to to various parts or search terms. Uh, with the you know with the introduction of um, of the the APIs into Facebook etc now there's the ability to target ads 
based to very specific groups of individuals on known interests and known kind of social circles. Um, but that's only kind of half the story. That's just pushing people to a place. So if you look at the bottom of this uh, slide, what the, the usual mechanic for a, uh, you know, for a, a voucher release, for a member get member, for whatever it might have been, would have been to push people to a website where they'd, um, where they'd redeem a voucher code of some type. Or you broadcast an email to a group of individuals with a, uh, you know, with a, with a barcode, barcode in it, with an offer, with whatever it might be. Um, and that was the end of the process. Maybe if you were lucky, they'd forward it on to people. Um, maybe if you were unlucky, they'd forward it on to people, um, depending on the the volume of uh, you know the volume of discounts you could afford to give out. But now we've got we've got a, access to a whole different um, a whole different world here. So if you look above in in blue in this kind of hypothetical situation now, where we we drive traffic to either a Facebook brand page or a um, or a Facebook app within a, you know with an existing page uh, with that same incentive on it. But now um, you're asking a little bit more of the recipient in order to uh, redeem that incentive. The first thing you're asking them to do is connect, because connecting is good. Connecting is better than liking, and connecting is better than becoming a fan for the brand, because the brand get access to a whole host of, um, of data that they, they never got access to before. And it, depending on the level of access you request, depends on how frequently you can access that data, how wide and how deep it is. Um, Maybe the second step of that is uh, on connecting the, the individuals as to, you know, shown a, a series of pictures of their friends and asked to, to recommend. That recommendation process, that referral process becomes a lot, more, um, a lot more interactive. If you see pictures of your friends, you're going to click on them. If you're asked to type in their email addresses into a form, you're less likely to do that. And then there's the, the redemption phase. So... There's this, there's this possibility now of a really slick mechanic that historically was very difficult to, uh, to create. That's what uh, the likes of Facebook have, have done. They've made it very easy for content to be, to be shared, for, um, for offers to, be, to become viral. And as marketers, we, we see the benefit of that. We see wider reach for the campaigns that we're sending. We see data that we gather off the back of it. We get to know who, who are the people who we need to influence. You get to know whether people value your brand and value the offers that are being sent by how widely they're willing to share it amongst their, uh, their circle of friends. So there's a, whole, there's a whole host of things we can use to, to kind of glean that information. And then the final part is, um, so coming from an email background, I get, um, I get bored to, about uh, hearing about how we, we need to make things more relevant, but nobody actually tells you how you go about doing that. It's... It doesn't. It doesn't work like that. So, so social media for me there is is fascinating in that um, we get access to data like we've never had before, and it's data that's it's real time data. It's interesting data. It's data that actually gives us the ability to tailor our communications and make them more relevant. The the like data, friend data, that that open graph data, that what what have people been reading, listening to, um, that kind of ongoing feed of real time information how influential they are, whether they've checked in to, to various locations. There's a mass of information that if we can't uh, generate something relevant from that, then we should probably shut up shop and go home. Um, but it also, um, it also gives, us, um, gives us some kind of use cases for it because it's not just about taking social media and using it on social media sites and generating traffic from social media. It's about how we take what we learn and put that across the, the other pieces of real estate that I mentioned earlier, whether that's personalizing content on sites or putting on recommended products through the kind of Facebook widgets that are available, whether it's using um, email to do member get member, whether it's, it's creating this kind of frictionless sharing, the ability to like emails, like products, share with friends, um, or whether it's actual, it's actual apps that sit within social, um, social networks and generate content. There's a, whole, there's a whole variety of things that are beyond simply generating traffic from a page. So the outcome of that, though, is, um, is we get a whole host of more data, and I would argue more relevant and pertinent data. That allows us to enhance the content because we know far more about what people are interested in and when they're interested in it, and that generates a whole, um, a whole host of better results. So we can kind of summarize that in um, is that the, the impact of social data is that you can genuinely know more about the, the people you're trying to talk to, 
you can proliferate your content. Facebook are really big on this frictionless sharing thing. Um, and it is about the sheer volume of data and the depth of data um, that you should then be using to personalize and communicate with those, uh, with those people for longer. There are some there's success, there's success stories that come out of this, and there are, and there are kind of nightmares, but um, I think it's, it's nothing that we haven't looked at before. It's just there is far more of it. It's far more real time. And, um, and it allows us to probably go far further than we have historically. Thanks very much, Matt. <clears throat> and so um, the sort of the final piece that we wanted to talk about today um, is sort of going back to Facebook. Um, obviously, as Matt's just said, it's not just about um, being able to uh, drive extra traffic to, to a website. And there's so much value that can be um, taken from using social data. And actually, the data itself is um, the thing which ultimately can be the sort of the most intrinsically useful part to you. Um, but we know, and we know that there are lots of um, challenges uh, to marketing teams and, and anyone who has to sort of use social is to say, okay, well, what's the ROI? What's the value? And why do I have to invest in social media? And so... Um, for those uh, people to sort of start the ball rolling about, all right, what is the value and, and how can I get some actual um, numbers around that, we've done some um, analysis which sort of starts to answer that question. So the sort, of the, the sort of the the base thing is that, generally speaking, the more likes you have on Facebook, um, the more uh, people that you'll get and the more visits that you'll get to your website. Um, and that's always been a very tricky thing to um, be able to attribute. Um, but we started to um, do some analysis about the sort of the, the user journeys and the content, um, the way that people travel between websites. Um, and so we came up uh, with this uh, statistic that um, for each additional Facebook fan um, that you have on your page, um, that generates over the course of a year an additional 20 visits um, to your website. And the way we did that um, is basically we took the top uh, 100 brands um, on, uh, online, top 100 retailers online, um, and then benchmarked uh, them against the number of fans which they have on Facebook. Now, we know, for example, uh, that Facebook works in, a, in sort of two um, broadly different ways. You can either get people coming, uh, let's say your top shop, you can go from the top shop um, Facebook brand page directly to the top shop website, so sort of direct um, traffic, or there's the sort of slightly more indirect way where people can be um, affected by something that they see on Facebook, then they'll go to Google and type Topshop and then come through to the Topshop website. So taking a combination of that data um, of um, either direct traffic or sort of indirect traffic um, via sort of someone who's um, then searched for a brand after um, a, a visit uh, to the branded page, um, we came and, and we saw that um, there was this uh, very um, straight correlation between um, the more fans that you have, the more visits you get. And so, yeah, for each additional fan that you get, you can expect 20 additional visits over the course of a year. So that starts to sort of paint an ROI model of if you know um, how much your sort of your average um, uh, person who comes to your website, how much they spend, um, for each additional fan, so if you've got um, an extra 10,000 fans, that's an additional 200,000 visits. Um, coming to your website over the course of the year, and that starts to become quite a sort of compelling picture. Um, that kind of model is, is something which lots of people do, um, and, and, and sort of fan acquisition is something which is um, quite popular online. It does, uh, has created a bit of a gold rush, and um, so one of the things that we just want to sort of rein back on is it's not just about getting the volume of fans, and I think that's sort of one of the key things that we're trying to sort of um, show in this webinar is it's not just about purely about volume um, it's about being uh, taking things the right way so um, this is a sort of example of where things can start to go wrong um, John Lewis uh, went out and, and started acquiring a lot of fans on Facebook um, but because they weren't um, going about it in a particularly targeted way um, what we saw was that uh, when we analyzed their uh, visits to their website versus um, visits to their Facebook fan page they were attracting very different audiences. Um, and so uh, the red uh, bars there show um, the um, mosaic demographics. So it's basically the sort of the types of people that um, John Lewis typically 
um, get uh, coming to their um, home page and so um, the John Lewis brand is quite a sort of uh, a, a sort of an affluent and um, aspirational brand and so um, because of that uh, they get a lot of traffic from um, liberal opinions um, alpha territory and professional rewards so those ones where the sort of the red bars are very high and um, these are sort of uh, affluent people with high um, uh, net worth um, high disposable income and uh, living in the sort of the um, urban nice areas of, of London or sort of the leafy suburbs um, but if you compare that to um, some of the blue bars um, which is um, where John Lewis was starting to get um, traffic from their fan page um, you can see that some of the uh, some of the audiences are quite disparate so um, on the fan page they were getting lots of traffic from um, the likes of uh, ex-council community, industrial heritage, um, and terrace melting pot. And we know by sort of understanding what these groups look like that actually these are not John Lewis's sort of core user base or core customers. The um, the net household income that they have, or their sort of their um, predisposition to um, spend money on um, on some of John Lewis's products um, is just not there. So even though they you know they were attracting a lot of fans because they weren't getting the right fans, that wasn't actually helping them make more sales. And so um, the sort of the key thing is making sure that um, when you go about uh, fan acquisition, um, it can be hugely, hugely profitable, but it's got to be getting the right fans. And so that's where we've talked about some of the sort of the data which is available means that you can really be sort of really smart about the targeting which you do. That's just about it for us. Um, just wanted to sort of wrap up with some of the key takeaways from um, from this session. Um, social media is is massive. So um, when we started, we were talking about sort of how big is social and, and what's the sort of the overall outline. Um, a quarter of all time spent online in the UK is on a social website, and with those 2.5 billion visits a month going to social websites uh, in the UK alone, um, this is a huge channel for you to be interacting with. Um, Facebook is very much the sort of the dominating force in this industry, and we. Um, you know we see that sort of continuing in the foreseeable future um, but the sort of the key sort of thing is that actually there's 9,000 different social networks um, which Hitwise monitors on a daily basis which have all of these sort of different niche audiences um, which are ready to be sort of tapped into. Social as we um, have shown is sort of can be uh, a sort of key component of that no get keep cycle um, and really it's about being able to use the social data um, to enhance your understanding of who your customers are. Um, and social really represents an opportunity for you to learn about your customers and then create some really um, valuable content which is going to be able to engage them. So it's not just about um, being able to drive more traffic to your website. There's so much more than that that we can sort of, um, we can see the benefit of that. However, you know, if, we know that um, people are being um, tasked on ROI and, and so um, with marketing budgets being cut and all the rest of it, you need to be able to um, show that what you're doing is actually um, driving value. And so by using um, this uh, statistic about for every fan you have um, that can generate 20 additional visits to your website, um, this really sort of starts to show some of the um, direct ROI that you can get from um, advertising on Facebook and using Facebook as a platform. Um, having said that, it's not purely about volume, um, and if you just go about it in the wrong way, attracting the wrong kind of fans, that's not actually going to help you deliver. Um, you'll get more fans, but you won't necessarily get more sales. And that's where being smart about using the data and about targeting the right kind of people um, means that you can get a lot more benefit from that. And essentially, Experian is here to sort of help you do that. A final quick plug, um, if you want to understand more about um, some of the capabilities that we have and some of the things that we can do, um, please follow us on Twitter at hitwise underscore UK or go um, to uh, the website where there's lots of blog content about um, some of the things that we do and how we use data to sort of drive interesting insight. Um, we've also got some fantastic um, white papers and, and online resources which are there um, for you to understand more about some of the data that we have and um, how that can be used uh, to really sort of help you in your marketing strategy. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope you found it useful, and um, if you wish to know more, then please do get in touch. <laughs>